the 2018 Atlanta Press Club Loudermilk Young Debate Series. Brought to you from the studios of Georgia Public Broadcasting. This is the race for the 7th Congressional District. Welcome, I'm Giancarlo Cifuentes, Regional News Director at Univision Atlanta. You are watching the Atlanta Press Club Laudermilk Young Debate Series, originating from the studios of Georgia Public Broadcasting here in Atlanta. This is the debate among candidates for Georgia's Congressional District 7. District 7 converts a part of portions of Northeast Atlanta, including large portions of Eastern Georgia, including Peachtree Corners, North Cross, Cumming, Duluth, and Suwanee. Let's meet the candidates. They are in alphabetical order. Caroline Boudot, a Democrat, is a professor at Georgia State University's Andrew Yan School of Public Policy. And Rob Woodall, a Republican, has represented Georgia's seventh congressional district since 2011. Now let's meet our panelists. Doug Richards is a reporter with 11 Alive TV in Atlanta. And Jacqueline Schultz is a multimedia journalist with Fox 5 TV in Atlanta. Now let's get started for rules on today's debates. Please visit the Atlanta Press Club website, atlantapressclub.org. To start the debate, each candidate will be asked a one question. Jacqueline Schultz, you get the first question to Rob Woodall. Thank you so much. Congressman Woodall, some figures report 71,000 unauthorized residents in Gwinnett County in your district. How does your immigration plan address those immigrants' path to citizenship as well as enforce federal law? Well, we voted on two bills in the House uh, this year that would have done exactly that, uh, provide a pathway forward uh, for those uh, families, as well as uh, establish an enforcement uh, program going forward so that we wouldn't end up in this same space a generation from now. Of course, that's the <clears> problem <throat> with the, the Dreamer bill. That's the problem with the DACA bill. You had to get here before 2007 to even have an access to those protections. We already have 10 more years of young people who've been affected. America wants the best and the brightest uh, to be here. We have an opportunity. I see those kids in high schools across Gwinnett and Forsyth County, but it has to be a legal pathway forward. If we're going to provide a pathway to the best and the brightest who are living overseas today, can't we also extend that pathway to the best and the brightest who are right here in our high schools today? The answer is we can and we would have if the bill that I'd supported in the House this year had become the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Doug Richards, you get to ask the first question to Caroline Boudot. Uh, Dr. Bordeaux, off of sort of the same topic, uh, there is a caravan of folks coming from Central America trying to get through Mexico to the southern border of the United States. Uh, President Trump seems to view this as uh, something approaching a national security crisis. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, what's your take on that as, as pertains to that issue and the immigration issue generally? I think the greatest nation in the world, our country, can handle 5,000 immigrants, many of whom are fleeing for their lives, coming to our country to seek safety. We need an immigration policy that respects human dignity, recognizes economic reality. What we don't need is an immigration policy where we, we are separating children from their parents at the border. This country has lost its moral bearings when it thinks that that kind of policy is okay. I would like to ensure that we don't have that kind of thing happen and that we treat refugees, people who have a fear for their lives, with dignity and respect when they apply for safety and asylum when they come to this country. Very well. That concludes the first portion of the debate. The candidates will now ask a question to their opponent. Each candidate will have 30 seconds to ask the question, 60 seconds to respond, and 30 seconds for a rebuttal. By random selection, Caroline Boudot, you may ask the first question. Okay. Congressman Woodall, you voted 17 times to eliminate protections for people with pre-existing conditions. If you go to my website, it's carolynforcongress.com, we have a list of those votes. Half of the adults under 65 in the district have a pre-existing condition. You, have, you had to have known the misery it would inflict on your constituents. So whose interests were you serving? when you've repeatedly voted to eliminate protections for people with pre-existing conditions? Well, my response, Carolyn, is whose interest are we serving when we try to 
uh, uh, grandstand in that way. I think you know, because you've studied these issues for a long time, pre-existing conditions were first attacked by Republicans uh, led by Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton in the White House. Every American with a pre-existing condition in the country who was in, in a plan that the federal government regulated Home Depot, Delta, all of the big plans across the country. We abolished pre-existing conditions for every single one of those families in a very successful program. What President Obama tried to do with the Affordable Care Act was to say a one-size-fits-all is going to cover everybody else. And what we found is that ran young people out of the program, pushed the oldest and the sickest people into the program, and raised rates so that no one could afford the program. Protecting people is a common value, but we have to do it in a way that makes common sense. And programs that no one can afford uh, is not the right answer. You get 30 seconds to rebuttal. The, you have voted 17 times to repeal those protections for people with pre-existing conditions. There is a woman in the district uh, who I met the other day. She's a small businesswoman on the exchange. She's had five blood clots. The provisions being pushed by your caucus would mean that she would go bankrupt or be dead without the protection for people with pre-existing conditions. I am here to protect people who have pre-existing conditions and make sure that they have the health insurance that they need. Mr. Woodrows, is your time for your question. I appreciate that, Giancarlo. I guess my question would be, and you've run that pre-existing condition attack uh, over and over and over again. We know that's not true. The other attack that you run is to say that Woodall voted uh, <laughs> to ask older Americans to pay five times more. Uh, Barbara in the district asked me about that the other day. She said, Rob, I know that's not true, but what does Carolyn mean when she makes that accusation? And so I put that question to you today. That is absolutely true. The American Health Care Act that you supported not only would strip protections from people with pre-existing conditions, but would also allow insurance companies to charge older Americans five times more. That is crazy. That legislation would have block granted Medicaid. Uh, Sixty percent of the people in nursing homes receive Medicaid. That bill was terrible public policy, and that's actually why it went down. We need to go back and fix the Affordable Care Act, implement it the way it was intended, and introduce a public option to the exchange so that every citizen has affordable, quality health care. Mr. Woodrow, you have 30 seconds to rebuttal. Thank you. You know, Politi PolitiFact looked at that uh, claim because Democrats are making it all across uh, the country today uh, and uh, noted that it's not uh, uh, true. We can't provide health care uh, without the resources to do so. And someone's going to pay for that care. What the Affordable Care Act did was to say young people are going to pay so much they're going to drop out of the system. Uh, that is a broken and failed system. We cannot perpetuate that. It is providing care for no one. But every single Republican replacement plan covers pre-existing conditions, takes care of our older okay. Americans, shores up the Medicare program. And that's what we hope seconds. to go back and continue to do today. Thank, Thank you, sir. Well, that concludes our second round. For those just joining us, this is the debate between candidates for the Georgia's 7th Congressional District. Uh, we will go now to the panel to ask questions to the candidates of his or her choice until we run out of time. At what point, uh, I'm, as a moderator, have the privilege to also have questions and ask them. Uh, we'll determine when a rebuttal is appropriate. Um, Doc, let's start with you. Okay. I'd like to ask a question of both of you, starting with you, Congressman Woodall. Uh, some of the leadership in Congress has recently posited that uh, the reason the federal debt is so large and that the deficits have ballooned so much is not because of the tax cuts that were passed, uh, but rather uh, due to entitlement spending. What's your take on that? Well, that's, that's undeniably true. CBO has been reporting that going forward, uh, not just this year, but last year and the year before that and the year before that. Doug, tax receipts today in the federal government are the highest level they've ever been in American history. It seems difficult to argue that if our tax receipts are the highest they've ever been and we still have a deficit, that that problem is because taxes aren't high enough. It's that spending is growing even faster. And there are lots of things that we can do in partnership in a bipartisan way to solve that. As you know, I serve on a bipartisan, bicameral committee to do exactly that. I was proud to be trusted with that responsibility. And I look forward to the bill we'll bring to the floor later next month. Dr. Bordeaux. Right. So 
what we have is a situation where the Republicans passed a enormous tax bill that gave away tons of money to large corporations and very wealthy individuals. What that was was an enormous swipe on our national credit card that the Congressional Budget Office has said is going to add two trillion dollars mm -hmm. to our national debt. That brings it up to twenty one trillion dollars. Uh, and now Mitch McConnell, M McConnell, the leader of the Senate Republicans, is like, oh, we can't afford to pay for Medicare and Social Security anymore. That is wrong. Can I ask a follow-up? Just one quick follow-up. Would you repeal uh, that tax cut if you were uh, elected to Congress? I would certainly revisit it. Uh, Wells Fargo, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, they don't need $7 billion, and that's what they get in one year. They don't need those kinds of tax cuts. Nice. You turn Jacqueline to ask a question. This is for Professor Bordeaux. You say you're for, quote, common sense gun reform. What does that exactly mean while maintaining Second Amendment rights? Right. So I think many of us who are parents have seen the terrible shootings at schools. And, uh, you know, on the TV, you see often, you know, the dead children in other countries. What they never show you is what a bullet does to the body of a child. We can do better. There are very common sense gun reforms that will make a difference. First of all, we need to have universal background checks that close the gun show loophole. My opponent does not support that. So any crazy violent murderer can go to a gun show and purchase an AR-15 and go shoot up a school. That's nuts. We can change that. I think we need to have a ban on military style assault weapons. We need to ban the high capacity magazines that feed them and get rid of bump stocks. And those are some basic things that most Americans agree on. Congressman, would you like to respond? Well, it's just nonsense to suggest that uh, we don't have some common ground there. Of, of course we, of course we do. Uh, the law already uh, forbids felons uh, from purchasing uh, guns. We can make it even more illegal than it already is, but it's already illegal. The law already prevents folks from doing bad things with guns. So we can make it more illegal, but it's already uh, illegal. Uh, my first uh, a rifle came from Santa Claus under the Christmas tree. Uh, uh, culturally, things are different uh, in the in the South than they might be in the North and they might be in the in the Northeast. We're not going to run a background check uh, on a mom to give that gun to her son uh, under the under the Christmas tree. But when it came to enforcing that background check system, while others voted no, I voted yes to fully fund the national instant background uh, check system. I voted yes to make sure we have everyone uh, with. A, a mental illness registered on that uh, on that program. We can do more. What we can't do is let folks disguise their anti-gun uh, uh, policy agenda uh, under the guise of protecting our children. This is a question for both candidates. Um, what's your point of view on the discussions that we had a couple of months ago about teachers carrying uh, guns to school? Mr. Woodall first. The, I can't imagine why that would be a good idea. Uh, here in Gwinnett and Forsyth mm -hmm. counties, we have amazing school resource officers. As taxpayers, we invest in trained law enforcement officers to go in and be present uh, in our schools and protect our children. Our teachers signed up to teach young people. Our law enforcement personnel signed up to protect those young people uh, from bad actors. No, I don't need armed uh, teachers. I need uh, trained, competent security personnel, and I'm proud that in our district uh, we're living that model today. Professor Bordeaux? Yeah. I just want to go back to the background check issue. Uh, yes, it's illegal for a felon to purchase a gun, but if there's no background check at a gun show, how do you know if he's purchasing the gun or not? But just to go to this, no, teachers should not be armed in schools. And it's a measure of how far our debate has swung to the right that that is even on the table. Uh, insurance companies won't insure schools where teachers are armed. Uh, teachers need to have the supplies they need to teach. We don't need to be spending money on weapons for our teachers. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Doug, you turn. Uh, let's talk about uh, infrastructure and, and transit. Congressman Woodall, um, a recent, recently a, uh, a, a bus line was funded uh, through your district up Georgia 400 mm -hmm. um, to great celebration on the part of you and uh, Congresswoman Handel. Um, as Congress ponders a new infrastructure bill, um, do you think that there is enough attention being given to uh, bus, or excuse me, to train transit and rail transit in big cities like Atlanta and Metro Atlanta? Well, Doug, I think what we've found is heavy rail isn't 
financially viable today. When you look at deployments across the country, you do see bus ra rapid transit, you do see light rail deployments. So I think folks are moving away from that most expensive uh, method of transit, moving into other opportunities. We're going to have that referendum uh, in uh, March in Gwinnett County uh, this year, as you point out, uh, Forsyth County through that Georgia 400 uh, project is already uh, moving in that direction. Uh, there's absolutely a desire for livable, workable, walkable communities. Transit's going to be a part of that. But as always, there's smart ways to spend money and there's ways to throw money uh, away. Uh, the constituents in the 7th District of Georgia are happy to fund those projects that get them a rate of return on that investment, but they are understandably skeptical of some of the projects uh, dating back uh, decades uh, here in the metro Atlanta area. Do you mind if uh, sure, Dr. Ahead. Bordeaux, do you mind answering that question? No. All right. right. So folks in the 7th District have a soul-sucking commute, and we absolutely must invest in transit. A lot of what they're talking about right now is bus rapid transit, and I absolutely support that. When I worked for Senator Ron Wyden back in my early career, I helped Portland, Oregon get funding for their light rail system. What has happened in the 7th Congressional District is that we have been sending our money all over the country uh, to support transit and transportation systems and other metro areas, and it's time for us to bring some of that money back home to help us build out our own transit systems. Jacqueline, your turn. Uh, Congressman Woodall, uh, you've praised and you're a strong supporter of President Trump's economic policy. However, from farmers to a lot of small businesses in Georgia, they've said they've been feeling really hit by the tariffs on China. Mm -hmm. How do you address those business concerns of Georgians? Well, they, they are absolutely being hit by those tariffs. They're also being hit by the unfair trade policies before those tariffs. There's only one nation on the planet that can take China on when it comes to unfair trade practices. That responsibility falls to the United States of America. And with constituent after constituent, company after company, here in the 7th District of Georgia, I hear exactly what you've said. Rob, this is making life harder on us. But, Rob, we have to pursue this course because if we don't, China is going to continue to be an unfair trade actor for decades uh, to come. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to come out on top uh, as a nation, as we did in the renegotiations with Mexico and Canada. Uh, it is painful today. It's going to be worth that effort tomorrow. That's what I hear from constituents, and that's what I believe. Professor, would you like to respond? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I just met with somebody yesterday who is in the construction business, and uh, the cost of wood, the cost of steel, uh, both have risen, and it's getting harder and harder to do business, and it's getting more expensive. We are engaging in trade wars now all over the world with all sorts of different countries, and it's not clear that there's really a very clear strategy here. Uh, we just have a president who seems willy-nilly to get angry with folks and then tear up our treaties. I don't see the overall strategy. I don't see what the overall goals are, uh, here are. And I think we need a Congress that stands up to the president and holds him accountable for these kinds of things. I have a question on my own. Um, there's been some talks about cutting fund, federal funding to cities or jurisdictions that uh, support uh, sanctuary cities. Uh, what's your take on, on this topic? And if we can start with Professor Boudot. Yeah. So what I would like to see is comprehensive immigration reform so that we don't have to worry about the sanctuary city issue. Um, I think we need an immigration policy that respects human dignity and recognizes the economic realities on the ground. And we'll start at the top again. First of all, we do not separate children from their parents at the border. That is immoral and wrong. Two, we need to deal with the issue of the dreamers. Uh, these are young folks. There are three to 7,000 in the 7th Congressional District who have been educated here, have enormous talent, and we need to give them a clear path to citizenship. Beyond that, we need to continue to draw the hardworking, the best and the brightest to the co this country. They stimulate business. They are good for the economy. Um, they are innovators. They are small business owners. And I celebrate the diversity of this country, and we need an immigration policy that does that as well. Congressman Woodall. They, you'll remember we brought two comprehensive immigration bills to the floor in the House. And if we'd gotten any Democratic support for those bills at all, we wouldn't even be having this conversation today because the Dreamers would be protected. But folks would rather vote no and save that as a political issue than solve those problems. I need fewer people with good one-liners and more people who are willing to sit down and roll up their sleeves and do the hard work. But directly to your question, ignoring federal law 
is never going to be the right answer. Let's work together to, to change the law. Let's pass those bills I'm, I'm talking about. Let's take this issue off the table. But the more we tell one another that you just get to pick and choose as a community, as a state, as a municipality, which laws you want to follow and which laws you don't, the more we undermine uh, one of those things that makes us uh, so great as a nation. And that's that we're all equal and we're all protected under the law. Mm -hmm. Doc, question? Uh, I want to ask you both about the Me Too movement. Uh, Congressman Woodall, President Trump recently uh, uh, sort of posted a, a theory that the Me Too movement was uh, dangerous to men. Do you, uh, to what extent do you agree with that uh, specifically, and how do you view it generally? Well, you may be following the president's Twitter feed more closely than I am following his Twitter feed. I didn't see that. Uh, I didn't see that comment. But again, when the spirit of, of, of doing what's right, of following the law, uh, if we have uh, young women among us, and we do, who've been the victim of assault, who've been the victim of, of discrimination, uh, the more we can send out the message that it's okay to come forward. In fact, you need to come forward because if you don't, this may happen to somebody else uh, tomorrow. That's all good uh, for this uh, for this country. There is a presumption of innocence uh, here. That's always been true. We have laws to protect people and a presumption of innocence to protect those who are accused. But the more we can make it okay, the more we can encourage and support our young women who are coming out and, and revealing their pain and their circumstances, I think the better off we are as a community and certainly the better off we are as a nation. Dr. Bordeaux. Yes. So uh, women make up 50 percent of the population. They make up 20 percent of the representatives in Congress. That's one of the reasons I'm running. We need a seat at the table. We have a president who, when he was running uh, for office would have rallies where the wild mobs would scream, lock her up, lock her up. And outside was an effigy of a woman in a cage. Uh, we have a president who was uh, on tape admitting to sexually assaulting women who many women have come forward and accused him of sexual assault. We see all sorts of rollbacks of protection for women, protection for equal pay, for equal work. And that needs to change. What we see is an extraordinary disrespect for women coming out of this administration, and our current congressman has done nothing about that. Jacqueline, last question, 30 seconds response. Okay, this is a question for both candidates. There's debate among veterans as to what to do regarding the Department of Veteran Affairs. Do we fix the problems, or do we keep funding veterans' choice to speed up the time that veterans are seen by a doctor? What's your, Congressman Woodall, let's start with you. Uh, what's your opinion there? Very proud of the Veterans Choice Program. I uh, voted uh, in favor of it, uh, helped to get it off the off the ground. What we see is a generational divide, Jacqueline. If you're an older veteran in America, you feel like the VA is the only group of docs that understands you, and you want to make sure that system continues to work uh, well into the future. If you're a younger veteran, you're used to having choice, and you want to be op able to opt out and go see your own doctor. Yes, it costs more to run the Veterans Choice Program, but it's the right thing to do to put a stop to these long lines that have undeniably uh, disadvantaged veterans of all ages. Thank you. And, and uh, Professor. Right. Absolutely. We owe our veterans utmost respect, and the long lines at the VA are inappropriate. And I think this is one area where I agree with our congressman. That being said, what we see happening with these private plans is it's draining uh, our current VA programs. It's making them less effective. It's harder for them to operate because the money is being transferred to private providers. We do need to go back. We need to make sure that our public VA system works and is effective for our veterans. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. Each candidate now will have 60 seconds for a closing statement, and we will start with um, Congressman Rob Woodall. The, uh, thank you very much, John Carlo. I appreciate uh, your moderating us today. Uh, Doug, thank you for being here. Jacqueline, thank you for being here. Thank you to the Press Club for continuing to do these debates. We have a lot of opportunity to get information, and, and this is still one of the most valuable. Uh, I think what you've seen here uh, today is a, is a stark uh, contrast. You see a lot of uh, uh, angry, uh, uh, a lot of animus uh, towards the President of the United States. And if this were a presidential election, this would be the time to, to have that conversation. If you want someone to continue to resist this president, you have a Democratic choice to do that. If you want someone to get results from this president, uh, you have a candidate who will do that uh, too. That's, uh, that's me. If what you want is to begin impeachment pr proceedings and criminal investigations, we have a
have a candidate who will take us down that road. If what you want to do is to provide pr problems with solutions, you have a candidate in me who is experienced at doing that, who's been successful at doing that, and with the vote of the 7th District of Georgia, will continue to do that uh, going forward. I ask uh, each uh, member of the 7th District uh, for their vote on November 6th, and I thank you for the privilege of serving you. Professor Bordeaux, your turn. Okay. Thank you all for hosting this debate, and thank you all for watching. My husband and I live with our six-year-old son in Swanee. I'm a professor of public policy at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State. I am running for Congress, though, because I do not want to leave my son and our children a broken and bankrupt democracy that fails to protect their future. We have a Congress that is in the pocket of special interests and a congressman who receives 60 percent of the funding for his campaign from special interest PACs, and he votes accordingly. We need campaign finance reform. We need affordable, quality health care. We need to bring the jobs of the future to our community. And that means investing in infrastructure and in transit. We need to make sure that our children have a world-class education. And as your Congresswoman, I will fight on your behalf for those things. I believe in a country that is diverse, inclusive, global in its outlook and aspirations. And I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate. We'd like to remind voters that Election Day is Tuesday, November 6th, and early voting has begun. Our thanks to the candidates and the panel of journalists here present. I would like also to thank the Atlanta Press Club and the Georgia Public Broadcasting for arranging today's debate. For more information on the full schedule of general elections debates, please visit atlantapressclub.org. This debate will be archived there and on Georgia Public Broadcasting website, gpb.org. This concludes the debate. Thank you.